Welcome, everyone. Please add to the chat where you're uh, joining us from today and what your camp name is. Just a few norms to help us get started before um, we start the meeting. Um, please mute your mic if you're not a panelist. If you have a comment or a question, just enter it into the chat. Um, we will be bringing your comments and questions into the presentation um, toward the end. And uh, we have a chat moderator here with us to uh, keep track of all those comments and questions. Um, so uh, please participate in the chat box. Uh, please be respectful in your participation and be present and please speak from your own experience. All right, so welcome everyone. This is the Red Folder Workshop. I am Epiphany from VW Bus Camp and the Camp Support Team. Amongst other things, we create monthly campfire talks for camp enthusiasts. And I do this work because I am <laughs> deeply in love with you the people of Burning Man, who I think are the true art of Burning Man, um, the fine art of Burning Man. I have a packed um, panel of speakers to join us today. Um, they are all fantastic speakers. As I introduce you, please feel free to unmute and say hi. First, we have with us um, Lucky. He is a physician's associate from Planned Playa Hood. Hey, everybody. Lucky from Plan Pilothood. Right on. And Impulse, she is a camp lead for Joby Coffee, Tea, or Me. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Impulse. Uh, Tetris is an RN and camp lead from the Black Rock City Piano Bar. Hello, everybody. And Buck, a camp lead for Remote Control. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Buck. Travis is with us. He's retired from 17 years with ESD and from fire camp. <laughs> Hi, Travis. Uh, Birdie is also with us. She is a mental health professional and supervisor with Zendo. Hello. Hi, Birdie. Um, Anna Duffy is with us. She heads up the crisis intervention team. Are you with us, Anna? <laughs> All right, she might still be trying to get set up. We also have last but not least, um, our chat moderator, Bex from Never Sleep Again. Thank you, Bex. And our tech mod is Abaj from Blinsco. Hi, Abaj, thank you. <laughs> All right, so what is a red folder? A red folder is red and it's easy to see. It holds information that may be needed to help navigate a crisis situation, and it's kept in an easy access location. I just wanna emphasize that the resources we are sharing here today have been compiled by burners and camp organizers to be shared amongst camps. So we are not speaking today for the Burning Man organization or any departments. Um, Let's start off with a question for our speakers. So what emergencies have you survived or managed in your camps? Hi, this is Tetris. Um, well, the, the very first day that I was on camp, um, I tripped over a spike and broke my nose. So that was a personal one. That was day one, my very first burn ever. Um, but more importantly, um, we did have a situation where an individual was riding a one wheel and fell right in front of our camp, uh, fractured his jaw, fractured his clavicle, um, broke some ribs, and we had to activate the EMS uh, system. And luckily, we did have a good emergency kit, so we were able to stabilize him. And then the EMT came, they took him, and unfortunately, his burn was over. So that is one that we had to deal with. And in our village last year, we um, had somebody who had a cardiac problem and over the course of the four days of, of um, setup, he ended up just deteriorating and we had to send him to the village, to the, um, the hospital a couple of times. And then finally he ended up having to go home. So those are things that we've dealt with. 
I bet they were pretty um, grateful that you were there to help support them in those moments. It does. It did help. But I have to say that, yes, I have a medical background, but there were other people that were trained and were taught by our camp leads. So everybody was was helpful. And I think that that's the point of this is that you don't have to be a medical professional to be prepared. So we're here hoping to prepare people uh, to to take care of of their campmates and and our, our fellow burners. Because why? Because shit happens. Um, anybody else have a fun emergency story to share with us? Well, I'm glad to share. I Burning Man is where everything can and does happen in some form. And I am the reason our camp has emergency and emergency folder, basically. I have dislocated an elbow. I've gotten a major concussion. Both of those were going down slides. As an adult, it's hard to explain to your doctor off playa. Um, I've had food poisoning. I found out I was allergic to tobacco. It, you know, it, I, about two out of three years, I've ended up with some kind of medical thing and that's just mine, you know, and, and I'm not, none of them were th- being unreasonable, but we've seen bigger and smaller things throughout our camp, our hub and our neighborhood. So I'm glad for more people to be trained as well to be thinking about this. Yeah, so some of us have created Red Folder to help us manage an emergency or navigate some kind of crisis. Um, Anybody have a Red Folder that you wanna talk about? After working on this project, I I think I would store my Red Folder with a light and put glow in the dark stickers on it and have reflective tape so that any time of day or night I could get to it and it would be easy. What are yours like? But- I can speak to that. Um, mine is um, hot pink. <laughs> it can be seen from outer space, <laughs> but I still store it with a light and uh, reflective tape also and in a place that everyone knows where it is. Right on. Um, So we divided our discussion today into two parts. Um, We have content for preparation in advance. And then also our second part is um, creating a red folder to have in hand once you're on Playa. We will share a single folder that contains every resource we're gonna discuss today. Um, So you don't have to try to run around in the chat, catching all of the links that are coming by. Um, We're gonna give it to you in all together in one folder. Um, So let's get started with the prep section. We wanna make sure that our folks at home and someone in camp has enough information to reach each other, um, be it like camp name, given name, playa name, camp address, How do you all prepare your campers before leaving for the playa? Buck? Uh, In in our case, we um, put together a a roster. We make sure everyone has it. And um, so that everyone knows where everybody is and how to find them. And this has helped us when we've had breakdowns along the way. We've been able to find other vehicles following them that can pick up parts for trucks, uh, all that sort of thing. It's been very helpful. We also have a camper emergency information, and this is something that I keep um, and is confidential. It has the name, the emergency contact, and phone. And if they have anything they need to share with us that they want to about allergies, medications, uh, health conditions, um, they share that with us also. And I, and I again, I keep that um in the red folder. Right on. I liked your idea for keys. Can we get the next slide? Yeah, this is something that we learned also to do a camp roster uh, that has um, everyone's vehicle information. And they supply me with um, a copy of their key, which I keep on um, a lanyard. And um, if something happens and a vehicle needs to be moved for emergency or other purposes and they're not in camp, we are able to move their vehicles for them. And that uh, we learned our first year. <laughs> and uh, that's been very helpful for us. Yes. We also do a, a reliability waiver, um, which is um, it's like liability uh, for anything 
it, it's it helps the camp not be responsible um or the or the uh, lead of the camp not be responsible when something goes wrong it's a uh, sort of an expanded version of what's on the back of everyone's ticket just reminding them that it's kind of nasty there and they could die and that it's not our fault it's theirs <laughs> Uh, and, and I think that's uh, important. And we're going to Im improve on this by adding uh, release of information too, because I think that's uh, going to be. I'm gonna, yeah. <laughs> we, All right. We also have a conflict resolution uh, steps. Uh, it's an escalation path for people solving their own minor conflicts. Uh, within the camp, whenever they something comes up, and I believe we'll be discussing this in a little bit more detail later. But for us, uh, this is just a really good way for people to um, to sort of handle it themselves. Nice. Yeah, it helps take the burden off of the camp lead. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, right on. Okay, next slide. ESD has given us a um, release of information that will also be in the file. Um, that's okay. I think I, 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 I think I took out this slide for this, but I did want to talk about it. Um, one thing I've learned in doing this project is that if, if you get hurt or have an emergency on Playa or one of your campers does, if they go to medical services, um, HIPAA is still in place. And so they cannot give you or anyone in your camp information about each other without a release of information. So ESD was kind enough to share with us an example release of information that you can take um, and adapt for your camp um, and make sure that uh, your campers um, have one, uh, even if they just give it to a friend or someone else in camp that can hold on to it. Um, what are some essentials that a small camp lead should bring in their first aid kit, Lucky? All right, I put together a document about this. I kind of had an interest in um, having people be prepared for um, not only emergencies, but you know the common stuff that, uh, that occurs and uh, put together this list. Um, and uh, the idea is that it kind of fits into um, two, um, <clears throat> let's say Ziploc bags or a shoebox size tub. And if you, uh, if you scroll down past the, uh, the initial thing, there's a picture of it uh, there in, app, in action. I've organized it into um, one tub or one Ziploc of um, uh, item, you know, items, mostly for soft tissue injuries. We get a lot of that stuff at, at Burning Man. Um, and the other is uh, with the medicines. Um, and I've, in the list, I've organized the uh, medicines by the most um, uh, common, most essential um, down to, um, you know, would be nice to have, but, but not necessarily. Um, you're going you're gonna to get more information about Narcan later. Um, my word about Narcan to everything. If, if, it's, if you're wrong and it's not an opiate uh, poisoning, if it's a seizure, heart attack, something else, um, it's, you're, you're not going to hurt the person with that. You're going to shove that in their nose and spray it and hope that it helps. Um, it's, it's not, uh, you're not going to, uh, hesitate or think about it. You don't test that device. You pull it right out. You insert it in their nose and you, and you spray it. Um, saying the most essential piece is ibuprofen just because everyone gets beat up out there. Um, caution when the person is dehydrated, um, if they've just ran the ultra, uh, don't give them ibuprofen. You want to make them clear pee or it uh, could be dangerous for the kidneys. People with stomach issues can't take ibuprofen, but it is essential in your list. Tylenol we use for um, headaches, uh, safe to do with dehydration, uh, metabolized by the liver, not the kidneys, um, safe to take with ibuprofen. So if someone's broken a bone and you're, and you're trying to get them out of there, you can double up for, with, to get the maximum analgesia, ibuprofen with Tylenol. Um, if you need to, to, uh, to get someone, uh, where they're going, uh, put, uh, you know, an eye wash, you know, eye products can be used in noses and ears, um, uh, if, if needed. So it's, it's good to have eye wash, eye drops, um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, antibiotic ointment in the nose, a lot of no nose issues out there. I put, um, famotidine as a, as, it, as opposed to Tums or omeprazole or any other like stomach medicine, because it's a, uh, histamine two blocker. It's useful to get if someone gets hives 
or uh, allergic reaction to some food that they were allergic to or what have you um, can be really um, it double up with loratadine or Benadryl and then famotidine to, um, to get someone out of an allergic reaction. It's also very useful for heartburn, acid reflux, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So it's a good one to have around. Uh, you might consider, uh, you know, a, a laxative and a uh, anti-diarrheal in there. I, I left those off my list, uh, certainly. Um, if you had one prescription medicine um, that you uh, brought um, for your camp, you would consider Zofran, four milligrams. Um, and again, this is prescription only. This is for nausea and vomiting, safe to do with Tylenol, can help a little bit with diarrhea. Um, you wouldn't give it to someone if they had a um, heart conditions uh, due to something called QT prolongation. Um, uh, don't give it for seizure in people with seizure disorders that can lower the seizure threshold and don't give it with a uh, serotonin syndrome. Um, it's also a not first line for preg pregnancy and breastfeeding. Um, back to the ibuprofen and Tylenol thing. Um, ibuprofen is not first line for uh, pregnant breastfeeding. Tylenol would be. Um, if you had, if you took a second um, prescription medicine to the playa, um, it, I would recommend Macrobid. That's um, nitrophenitoin. It's an antibiotic. Um, uh, safe for pregnancy and breastfeeding. Uh, urinary tract infections uh, very common on the playa due to dehydration and people having sex, and um, it just it, it's super common. So if you were you know, had a camp and you were trying to keep people from going in. Um, that would be my recommendation. Um, medical gloves are the most important piece of uh, gear, of, of equipment. Protect yourself. At my camp, we do bike repair, so I also use them for bike repair and all sorts of things. Some scissors, uh, the trauma shears are very strong and um, you, you can't poke the person with that if you're cutting bandages on them, bandaging up some wound. Um, so keep those in your kit. Um, Coban um, is the, uh, the next item, super essential. And I've included some pictures of essential skills, buddy taping, a finger injury to an adjacent finger to, um, to splint it. Um, and then using Coban around, um, you know, an ankle or an injured ankle or wrist is, uh, most injuries will occur in the extremities. So um, have a good supply of Coban. Um, some way to poke a hole in a plastic water bottle or a, um, uh, you know, a water bottle with a little nozzle on top can be great for irrigating wounds. Uh, so I, um, it, it, that's the biggest thing you can do to keep something from getting infected is get the foreign bodies from the dust and everything else out uh, of the wound before you close it up. Uh, Band-aids are included, uh, lots of little scrapes, um, gauze, a, a pretty good amount of it. Skin glue was the next one. Um, there was a, a ESD produced document uh, that included tincture of benzoin and steri strips for closing little lacerations. Um, I, I tend to use Dermabond for everything, uh, dealer's choice on that. Um, some kind of uh, soap uh, or uh, betadine for cleaning things. Be nice to have, you can use just regular soap and, and water on um, all your cuts and scrapes. Antibiotic ointment. Um, Scrape for your nose as my nose gets dry out there and uh, can keep uh, bandages from sticking to wounds, which can be really helpful. Um, and I'll be, uh, I put my name at the top of this thing and I'm happy to, or my uh, email address, I'm happy to answer any questions about this document. There is also in the preparation folder an excellent produced um, one for the, um, that was made by ESD. Um, that's excellent. Um, it's a little bit more detailed. Mine's trimmed down. I trimmed out what I consider to be personal items. And this is just my recommendations. If you have an any size camp, have these things in a, in a kit. Yes, you can buy like an off the shelf, you know, um, med kit, but this, this is a little bit personalized to the kinds of things we see at Burning Man. Um, and um, so then you want, you want me to go ahead to the, uh, if we need to, uh, I really recommend everyone take a wilderness first aid class, CPR class. It's going to make you a better citizen of Black Rock City in the world. Um, my camp is 100 people. It, it ages are age two to 82. Um, so if you do need to call for help in my camp, um, it's, it's dual band radio um, in, this, in a prominent location. And there's a document about this that has the um, tone codes for the um, um, calling of help. Um, this radio goes to the 911 dispatch 
Um, that includes uh, rangers have a dispatch on their fire, medical, crisis intervention, um, hazardous materials. The only uh, comms team it doesn't reach is DPW because they have their own dispatch. Um, so you program your radio to um, at that uh, ahead of time, uh, turn it on. Is there any other? Oh, sorry. Sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Um, turn it on and then, you know, you're gonna um, wait for a second and make sure that you're not interrupting another emergency that's on there, listen. And then when you push down the, the uh, push to talk PTT button is on the side almost always on these things, a thumb button, hold it for a second and then say, 911, 911, this is a participant at seven and Northwest corner of seven and B. Two minutes ago, we witnessed a man with, who um, began clenching his chest while walking, then he collapsed. Bystanders determined he was not breathing. They have initiated CPR. We're gonna need an ambulance immediately. Do you copy? Um, or, you know, whatever is, and even if you're just requesting a couple rangers to help you wrangle someone to Zendo or whatever the case is, um, you, you use that same channel um, to, to, uh, to request additional resources. Um, so uh, do not use your uh, cell phone to call 911 on the playa. Um, it works poorly and causes more problems um, than, than it's worth. So um, these radios are not expensive. At the top of this um, document, there are a couple of recommendations that came from a, um, a fire guy who really knows radios. Um, so uh, those, re those models at the top will work with um, uh, Black Rock City 911 uh, dispatch. So um, it, those, those um, other, there are other models which will not reach the relevant frequencies. So um, just um, uh, keep that. In my camp, this is in a super prominent location, a plastic bag with a big red, oh, this thing never works, with a big red X on it saying this is medical. And it's got um, three doses of Narcan and the radio and a little card. And that's 100% of my campers know where the radio is and how to use the radio. And they know who the medical people are in camp. That's, that's what I expect of. And my, like I say, it's 100 person camp with five or six medical people on any given year. Right on. Yeah. Thanks, Lucky. Um, I, in my camp, I'm going to steal your idea and um, identify all of our medical personnel with Red Crosses so everyone can tell where their camp is and how to find them quickly because we have quite a few in camp. Um, so let's move on to fire extinguishers. Travis is going to talk to us about um, putting out the fires. Okay, we're going to start with a little short trading video first. Um, if you're a sound camp and you have a bad dubstep DGA, this is how you're going to extinguish a fire. So actually, um, in all seriousness, fires are, are, are not a, a minor situation. Fires can double in size every 30 seconds. Thus, you're the first line of defense until the fire department arrives. Once the fire department of Black Rock City is notified, it can take time for them to negotiate the streets, um, to get the busy streets to get to the emergency. Um, so you want to start extinguishing the fire and also initiate your camp's emergency response plan. Um, the reference sheet is in the prep folder. It talks about specifics for fire extinguishers. I'd recommend one larger extinguisher to dry chemical. Um, they have a reference called a, it's all in the, in the document. And one smaller dry chemical extinguisher per hazard, like a generator, a kitchen, or a general camp um, one. These can be bought online at your local big box retailers. Um, if you have a dry chemical fire extinguisher, use those on kitchen, generator, or fuel fire. It sprays out a fine powder and that will um, extinguish the fire. We'll talk about how to do that in a minute. Um, they can also be used on fabric fires for someone's tents on fire or your camp uh, your camp tent is on fire. Um, but you, you can use the dry chem on it. It's a little bit messy, but you can also use wire to help supplement that to help put out the fires there. Um, if you have any type of fires not near a generator, anywhere in the camp, you want to shut those generators down because it can burn through um, the wires and cause electrocutions. Um, you always want to have the fire extinguishers close to the area where the hazard is, but you don't want to have it right up next to the hazard. So 
Um, for instance, you wouldn't put the fire extinguisher like right next to the generator because the generator catches on fire. You can't necessarily get to the fire extinguisher. So put it like five to 10 feet away. Same thing with your kitchen ex extinguisher. Um, if you found fire in camp, you need to initiate that emergency response plan immediately and start attack on the fire um, with a close extinguisher. You want to call for your campmates to bring the other extinguishers to the base of the fire where you're attacking and also call for your adjacent camps to have them bring their fire extinguishers because they only last about eight seconds and you might need to use two extinguishers to put out a giant fire. Um, and you'd want to um, alert ESD, right? For any situation that you need a fire extinguisher? No, you would. You would anytime you're using the fire extinguisher, you should be alerting ESD. Right they'd on. rather show up. They'd rather show up and have nothing happening than rather show up and have a whole camp conflagration. So um, always Thank notify you. ESD if we're going to use a fire extinguisher. Um, to right use on. the fire Travis, What's that? Um, we're going to be moving on to Sherry, okay. pediatrician. She has some. Thoughts on parenting when bringing an infant or a young child to the playa? All right, thanks. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's it's a pleasure here to share with you a little bit about uh, the babies and young children who are at Burning Man. Uh, and I'd like to start with a story, actually, about myself experience I had last year, and hope. Fully um, uh, uh, won't ever happen again, but it it should happen. So I we have to be prepared. And and I what I hope to do in my short time here is to show you how babies and young children have special vulnerabilities that we always want to be uh, thoughtful about. Uh, last year, um, I'm sure you remember the dust storms and the high temperatures. Uh, and what I did to cope was I just shut myself in the van. I used distractions, I put on some music, I did some reading. And what I really knew uh, and was found much comfort in was that I knew that it would end. I didn't know when, but I knew that it would end. Uh, and then also later how I coped was I reflected on that experience. I told several people about it and that process of telling that story helped me to um, uh, process it. Infants and young children are unable to do these coping strategies. And additionally, they are unique uh, citizens of, of uh, Burning Man uh, when they're there because their brains are rapidly growing. Uh, they are making a million synapses per second, creating these neural pathways. Uh, they are exquisitely sensitive to environment, not only physically, but in that brain development as well. And they actually have a sense of vulnerability, although they're not able to express it in words. And they look to caring adults for protection, safety, and emotional co-regulation. So uh, they have special vulnerabilities, especially when their routines are changed. They, they don't have a whole lot of control or power in their lives, but those routines really help anchor them. When those routines are disrupted, it's, an, it's a stressful event for them. And again, they have immature coping skills, uh, they are sensitive to their parents' stress levels. And if I had had a child that, that was close to me uh, when I was in the van, that child would have sensed that I was under some stress at that time. And they manifest uh, symptoms, signs and symptoms that we can be aware of that uh, indicate that they are overstimulated and approaching being overwhelmed. And they will seek parents and caregivers protection to gain that sense of safety and that loving comfort. Next slide, please. So prevention is the best antidote to stress. Uh, taking the child's perspective and parents are the experts on their child. So the parents can know and should use that information that they know about what the child is sensitive to when they're showing signs of being overwhelmed, et cetera. Uh, and parents' role is to be attuned uh, and emotionally available, even when they themselves are stressed, uh, to be able to provide that comfort for their child. It's helpful to, to maintain the routines that you can when you bring an infant or young child to, to the playa and to start new ones. Uh, you know, when we think about a million synapses created every second, 
what is a week long experience for me is, I don't know, I'm just going to make up a number, a century uh, uh, for a, an infant that's developing and responding to the environment at that speed. Wow. Uh, it's also important. That's a lot to think about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I know it's really mind-boggling. A parent and bringing a child. Um, can we move? We're going to move forward in the slides. I'm sorry, Sherry. We're, we're well. We might have some more time in the Q and A at the end. Um, we're going to include. And can you advance again? Yeah, and again. Thank you. All right. So. Um, one thing that camp organizers might want to do um, is hold a safety meeting with their camps. Um, when, when you do this, uh, we have included this document in our materials. You might wanna have um, this, where is my stuff location and camp document filled out. Um, you will wanna train your campers on where these items are. They're the things that we consider to be um, the most important to identify. And um, it would also be a document inside the red folder that you'll, you'll have on hand or whoever grabs that red folder would have on hand. Next slide. We included also this safety meeting agenda and um, Impulse is gonna talk to us some more about her um, red folder and the scenarios they discuss in their camp safety meeting. Oh, we're a relatively small camp. Joby runs 25-ish on average, so we have slightly different needs, but, and we're part of a hub of about five camps, depending on the year, that, that are in that range, that are smaller camps. Um, in our camp, among other things, we have a a professional disaster planner, which is part of what started this. So we do a, we all do consent training and then we all in our camp go to a safety meeting where we discuss, you know, why we do it, why do we have a, this type of folder? Um, and we go through all the things that could happen and what we need to do with them. And we, you know, starting with the basic ones, if somebody's hurt, somebody's sick and working up to the big things. What if fire gets into the city? Um, what if there's big tragedies inside or outside of there? And it's, it's for us an engaged discussion back and forth. We come up with plans together. Um, and it, among other things, it helps everybody to feel a little bit more comfortable. If something happens, they know what to do. They can just deploy. Yeah, better to be prepared. Yeah. yeah. And then we have our red folders also online. And we give it out beforehand and we, we talk about it in meetings beforehand. And for the first time this year, I think we're going to try and get a group of us to also do first aid CPR training, things like that beforehand. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, and we included the Joby red folder in our materials as well. So the participants today will have access to that. Um, Tetris has for us some additional material that you might want to cover um, in your safety meeting. And can we get the next slide? And that is Joby's, yeah, Joby's red folder. And then um, Tetris is going to talk to us about Narcan training and COVID safety. Yes. Hi, everybody. Just a couple of things to add to um, what Lucky was saying, just really quickly. One, you should identify the person, the medical people in your um, in your camp and in your village. Just remember that they have limitations as well. One, they may not be licensed in the state of Nevada. So what the things that they bring and what they're willing to do will vary. So just make sure that you know how far you can take an emergency in your camp and, and even and what your resources you have. The other thing that I would recommend is um, if your camp has extra money, uh, something to invest in would be an AED, which is a, a defibrillator. Um, it's one of the most important things and one of the best ways to save somebody's life. They're about eight, nine hundred dollars. They're to be used by lay people. It tells you exactly what to do. They are they are definitely something that is uh definitely a benefit to have. So can we go on to the next slide? I think is Narcan. Oh, so this is just a copy of our medical emergency form. Again, I'm a nurse, so I have things a little more detailed. I do keep the this um, uh, seal uh, closed in, a, in my truck in a locked compartment. Um, it's just an example. Next. 
first aid kit. Keep going. I think you have my whole old presentation. Keep going. <laughs> I just want to get to the, yes, the next one is the important one, Narcan. So what is Narcan? Narcan is the antidote for an opioid, um, something that is incredibly high risk in uh, the Burning Man environment. It is so simple. And like Lucky said, this is the one thing, if you get nothing else out of this presentation, the one thing I want you to remember is that you cannot cause harm by using this. The only thing you can do by using this is to save somebody's life. What this does is it's a nasal spray. You put it into the nostril and you, you push on the button. If it is an opioid, that person's eyes will wake up immediately. What you do is you put that person in the recovery position, start talking to them, make sure they're okay. It's also recommended that you do it a second time because there's something called the rebound effect. So there are two doses in each box. And again, it is so simple. They don't need to, they don't need to inhale. They don't need, there's no instruction. Just put it in their nose, squish, squeeze the, the trigger, and you can see an immediate result. It is recommended that somebody who, who um, responds to Narcan, who has taken an opioid overdose, it is uh, recommended that they take, um, they seek medical help. That might be a little difficult, but make sure that somebody stays with them for a while and make sure that they really are, um, they are, the whole situation is resolved. Okay. Um, at the bottom of that is a brochure. And in that is also how you can learn to teach to use Narcan, which is really helpful if you're going to teach your village. Okay. Next slide. Um, one of the things that's really important, this slide's super important, the rules in state in different states are different. In California, where I am, you can go to your pharmacy and you can get uh, two doses of Narcan without a prescription. You can also order them from the California Department of Public Health. Nevada has different rules. You can actually go and get them, but you, if you don't live in that state, you won't be able to get them ahead of time. But if you look at that, um, at that link at the bottom, and we'll include it, um, it lists every state and what the requirements are. Most states, you can get it for free using your insurance card. And there is, like for the California one, there is actually a, um, a standing order that you can print that's signed by the governor and that you can take to the pharmacy. Um, next. COVID. Oh, unfortunately, I hate to be the one to bring up that big C word. <laughs> um, I do know that... Uh, we're all sick of it. We want to be done with it, but unfortunately, it isn't gone yet. Um, so, for the so, it is still recommended that you um, talk about it, talk, have a plan for what are you going to do if somebody gets sick. Um, and it, it's more complicated than you think because if somebody gets it, like for example, if I get it and I have to go home, well, what am I going to do? I, I can't take the whole piano bar with me. I can't take everything. So have a plan. Just make a plan. Make sure you bring some masks and make sure that you bring some antigen tests. What we did last year was we asked everybody to take a test before they came to Playa. And if somebody started not feeling well, we had tests available for them. Um, you know, you can, if you want, make the vaccination lists. That's, you know, that's neither here or there anymore. But I would definitely have masks. I would have a protocol. Uh, what do you do with somebody? How do you quarantine them? Um, and then I would have uh, some antigen tests in place. There is um, the links on there are the um, are the links for the Burning Man organization. They have their own regulations, CDC, which is uh, California. And then uh, we have um, the Nevada. I also included the link for the Nevada um, guidelines, uh, which are regularly updated. And uh, next, I think that is it for me. Yeah. All right. Can we stop the share, Abaj? Um, Tetris, I was wondering, do you have any thoughts about what, um, so what, um, uh, sorry, some considerations about to collect or not to collect medical information from your campers? So again, it all goes back to HIPAA, right? Privacy. You don't want anybody to divulge anything they don't want to say. So we didn't make it obligatory, but we did say, listen, if you lose consciousness and we have to activate the emergency system and you go, we need to tell them what is wrong with you, what your past history is, what medications you're on. And um, so it does behoove anybody to, to submit this information. I, I personally would ask that all camps who, who collect this information, make sure you, you let your people know that you're gonna put it in a safe place, you're gonna have it locked up and it's only gonna go to the emergency folks. It's nothing to be shared. And you know, 
98% of our people in our village uh, submitted their forms. And there was one that we really needed. So it's, it's, a, it's speak to your people and let them know that it's to help them. It's not to gather information. It's just to help them. And uh, hopefully they'll submit it. If not, then it's up to the uh, receiving physician to try and figure out what's going on. And that could, that could be fatal for them. So it's, it's in everybody's best interest. Yeah, lucky. Did you have most, some that? Yeah, the most important piece of information that I ask of every single camper that camps with me is I want to know if they have a seizure disorder or a heart condition. And, um, you know, we, we have uh, implanted defibrillators in camp. Like I said, you know, I have an 82 year old, the heart conditions, um, you know, and the, because if they lose consciousness, I want to know if, if it's neuro or, or cardio. Um, is, and, and I only share that information with the medical people. And like I say, there's like five of us in, in camp on And so the medical people know who in camp has a seizure disorder or a heart condition. Um, and it would be nice if we knew their medical allergies, but I do not ask like what medicines they take or anything like that. It's, it's, it's not necessary. And it's, it's a, it's an invasion of privacy. Yeah. So, so theme camp leaders or organizers can decide for themselves, um, what they, they think would work best for their camp. Um, Petrus, did you have any thoughts on what some more items that a bigger camp or a camp with trained responders might consider bringing? Yeah, I, I, we just up, you know, we, we definitely have everything that Lucky has. We bring things like for fractures and stuff, slings, definitely splints, like he said, um, electrolytes. We bring, we definitely bring electrolytes that we can add just in case somebody is just dehydrated. Um, you know, and again, you know, if you've got somebody who's a, a medical professional and wants to bring IV bags, they can do that, but it's not necessary. Just if you if you go back to your days of the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts and everything, and what did you learn in your basic first aid? Like that's the stuff you want to you want to make sure that you have in your kit. Nice. Yeah, this can add up to a lot of stuff. Um, so as we were planning, the question arose, can uh, medical supplies or um, preparation plans be part of hubs? Well, I've got a great hub I, and uh, camps, even one of my hub mates is on here. Um, and we're all people that started coordinating before the hub thing. Yeah, last year was our first attempt at, at officially hubbing and this year, we, have, we are sharing like our red book. Um, we've shared in the past, some of us have done the other trainings together, some of the talks. And this year we're actually going, we're sharing where our medical supplies are in a couple of our teams and some of the, um, of who we have in each camp so that we know who to go to in case of an emergency. We have a couple of EMTs, we have a couple of um, trained workers, um, wilderness first aid responders, we have a therapist in our hub, <laughs> uh, which is great for our hub. And because we face onto a plaza uh, usually, and we see a lot of people coming by, it's also, we feel it's important to share among our group for the greater safety. So as one of the resources, just like we're in some ways sharing, we're, we're sharing a lighting theme to make it a nicer experience for everyone. We're sharing water in some ways. We're also going to share some of the safety resources and some of the safety resource planning. Um, a couple of us are, are having very similar red books and including some of our most extreme scenarios because everything that can happen off playa can happen on playa. Right on, thank you. Um, I would like for our participants to get lively in the chat. Um, enter into the chat, what are some considerations that as we're discussing um, the content to prepare that you're making for your own camp? Oh, great. And I see some of us are sharing resources in the chat currently. That's perfect. Right on. Okay. Epiphany, there's a question about Narcan and how long does it last? Uh -huh. um, 
it's it's a medication, so it's got an expiration date on it. So it is. We keep ours in. Um, we keep ours in a, a cool RV just because we don't want it sitting out in a regular, you know, in the sun and everything else. But it has a reg it has a, an expiration date on it. So hopefully, Gabrielle, that answers your, your question. Right on. Thank you. Um, I, any keep mine, I keep mine on my person. I keep it with the radio. I keep keep it on. Keep one on on me on the bike all the time. I, I do. I do not keep it in a cool RV. I keep it where it could where it's going to be near a person who needs it. Other thoughts about our um, feedback in the chat at the moment? All right, let's go on to our contents of the red folder section. So um, we have talked about uh, there, there's a document on Narcan. Um, in the red folder and also the locations document is in there, but we've got some other things to share with you. So um, Bex is going to drop the, yep, the um, folder link right there and you're welcome to get in and take a look around. Um, Travis is going to talk with us some more about um, how to initiate an emergency response. Take it away, Travis. So um, like, We've talked before, don't dial 911, that can cause some confusion. Um, you need to get fire responses or EMS responses going as soon as possible. So we came up with a little sheet here, um, ACT, which is start your initial emergency actions to control the situation. Call verbally to other camps, see if they might have a medic or other fire extinguishers that they might need. Um, if you have the radio, like Lucky was saying, um, go through the whole radio protocol in order to power it up. Um, I won't repeat what he said. Um, the same thing, you want to make sure you, if you don't have a radio in your, this always happens is someone thinks that someone went to get help, is assign someone to be the runner. And they're going to they're gonna run to their closest first aid station, which you should have planned out um, on the emergency sheet that uh, Epiphany put out. Um, have them run till they get to the station, have them contact emergency services and say, hey, we have an emergency at our camp. Uh, while they are running to that location, if they see a BLM vehicle or a law enforcement vehicle or a, um, a Burning Man vehicle, a sticker or logo down the side, all those people usually have radios. They call the emergency in. And you'd want them to accompany you to the camp so that way they can uh, relay information to their dispatch about the size of the fire, what kind of emergency is happening, how it's going. And the final thing is place a flag around the street. Um, a lot of times we would have a hard time finding out which camp it is because Camp Bezos is a camp from Be Just. And you have a hard time finding it. So someone should be flagging it on the, the emergency services vehicle when they come up. If you're on a corner, send one to the actual emergency side. And uh, so you can send one to the direct responses to where the exact emergency is at. Again, it takes time to negotiate the city. So it's important to start that emer initial emergency response right away. And uh, we'd rather show up and not have an emergency and uh, get a chance to ride lights and the sirens through the fire through the, uh, through the city and have a non-emergency to actually show up and have a block of, of camps on fire. So just a little brief thing on how to initiate the emergency response of BRC. Right on, thank you. Um, we're gonna move on now, Abaj, to our one page reference sheets. So in the red folder to print materials, we have several um, quick reference sheets that you can find um, information that you might need um, to navigate a crisis. We collaborated with the emergency services department and Black Rock Rangers for their one page reference sheets. Um, so I'm very excited to share those. Next slide. And Lucky, would you like to talk about the one page sheet for Plan Fly Ahead? Sure. Um, like I say, all of my campers know who the medical um, people are in our camp. Um, the best time during open bar hours or during open hours, which is every afternoon, like, you know, two to five or whatever it is, um, there will be someone on call. There'll be, there'll be one of us there. Um, and then uh, if other times you can ask and, and they may, you know, go get someone for you. You can also catch us at sundown um, They'll because there will be a lot of a number of we do camp meals every evening. There'll be someone there. But you you access services at uh, Plan Playa by, by uh, asking the person behind the bar uh, and they will go get um, me or, or uh, one of us. 
Right on. Thanks. So you just have to go ask at the bar. <laughs> Pretty okay. much. All right. Um, we also have a conflict resolution one page for theme camp organizers or theme camp leaders. Um, if you're trying to help head off a situation that you have with a couple of campmates or um, help some folks work something out. Um, our, our friends in the conflict mediation breakout, which is at 2.30, um, put that conflict management one page together. So thank you for that. And if you wanna know more, you can go to their breakout. Um, next slide. We also have this one page for how to speak with a camper if you're concerned about their well being and you might want to, um, once you work through that, connect them with services. So we also have a one page um, on the next slide for the crisis intervention team. Anna Duffy, would you like to say a few words about that? She able to unmute. Guys, Hi. <laughs> can't talk. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. fine. Yeah, I was saying the host wouldn't let me unmute. Okay. <laughs> so real quick about the crisis intervention team. This It's called SIT. It's kind of an umbrella. It covers um, our crisis intervention team. It also includes a survivor advocacy team, which is sexual assault and domestic violence. So um, what we do, the crisis intervention team, pronounce it, is part of the emergency services department at Burning Man. And um, we have psychiatrists, psychologists, um, psych techs. We have a whole plethora of mental health volunteers who come out and volunteer their time. We also have on our survivor advocacy team, we have uh, community-based advocates, which are very different than like law enforcement advocates, which are system-based. Um, I can explain that offline sometime if anybody really wants to know, but they have privilege and they help sexual assault survivors. We have a, um, in addition to our team, we do, um, we work closely with the Green Dot Rangers. A lot of times the Green Dot Rangers will um, respond to a call and they, they're helping a person and they decide that the person needs to actually have an evaluation that they think that there is um, they might be acting unusual, but there may be a psychiatric situation. So they would call in a SIT team for an evaluation. In order to call in the SIT team, you can use the, you can ask for BlackRock Dispatch. If you have a ranger in your camp or a medical person, they can call into BlackRock Dispatch and you can ask for um, a crisis intervention team person to come out and do an evaluation. Or if you have someone that has disclosed um, a sexual assault or domestic violence, whether it be current at the event or it, you know, they're just triggered by a previous event, you can ask for a survivor advocacy team to come out. Uh, the other thing that we have is the SIT team, we don't handle people who are inebriated. They may have a site component going on at the same time, but until they sober up, we can't really do much to help them. Uh, and on this sheet too, you'll also notice that I did leave um, uh, I did give you some resources at the bottom of the page. You've got 988, there's a crisis text line. Now that we have cell phones and stuff working out at the center, people can actually call if they want in from the playa and talk to crisis counseling or do texting. And I think that's pretty much about it. I think I've covered it out. The document will be there for you guys to read. Thanks, Anna. Um, in a repeated service on our next slide, we have... Um, a Zendo one page, and Bertie is going to talk with us about that. Hey, yeah, I'll just um, be very brief. Um, most people are a bit familiar with Zendo. Uh, we're a project that um, offers a safe space and peer to peer support for anybody having any kind of challenging experience, whether it's drug related or otherwise. 
Um, an important piece to note is that we only provide services to those who are medically and psychologically stable. If you believe someone is having a medical or psychiatric emergency, then we need to be utilizing a medical uh, ESD on Playa. We provide support 24 seven, typically Monday through Monday, and we're uh, located at the three o'clock and nine o'clock keyholes near Rangers and medical. Um, and then the one page uh, sheet also just has our basic four principles of um, peer support. Uh, if I would summarize these in a line or two, I'd say, if you wanna show up and be a hero, your cape should say, I'm here to listen, uh, not I have all the answers. So the basics of um, our, our principles are um, how to listen, how to provide kind of safe space and to just be with a person, not force or guide or um, instruct. Let me know if you want more details on that, Leanne. Epiphany. Great. Thank you, Birdie. Um, you can hear more from Birdie also in the um, next breakout session. Uh, there's a consent breakout at 2.30. So um, our next one-page resource is for, for um, infant and young child stress management. Sherry? Um, sure, just very quickly, I'd, I'd like to just spotlight uh, those uh, signs that an infant or young child will present with that are not typically seen in adults uh, when uh, they are stressed. Uh, they, they may become uh, uh, cranky, restless, uh, babies even can clench their fist and, and physically become tense, or they may uh, uh, withdraw from uh, social interaction. Babies may hiccup, uh, frequent yawning or, or sneezing, uh, cry more than usual, show disruption in their sleep, uh, have a temporary loss of milestones, uh, a, a loss of words, a loss of uh, uh, communication skills, reverting to uh, bedwetting, become clingy and, and uh, have a shorter attention span or be more anxious and fearful of new situations or new people, or, or have increased tantrums, or, and they may have uh, belly and bowel changes. Uh, what uh, can uh, be done to uh, reestablish their sense of safety uh, and uh, and emotional self emotional regulation is that the adult, typically the parent, it should be it best, ideally the parent, to remain calm. So actually, being a parent, being aware of what their emotions are. On, and on the other comforting things that are listed there, this is in your um, uh, in your folder, your red folder. But the overarching thing is that uh, parents uh, who bring an infant or young child should be prepared to change their plans to, to in, in in the moment in the day um, uh, they had planned to participate in an activity and they find that they need to leave the activity and and go with their infant or young child to a quiet and and uh, uh, safe space. Thank you, Sherry. I think this is important information and I'm not a parent. And so I didn't know about this until we started to do this work together. Um, our next slide is about our Black Rock City First Aid booklet, which ESD has shared with us. And there is an entire printout um, on first aid that um, also uh, overlaps some of our, our information that we got from Lucky today um, and is great information. Um, you can print it out and add it to your red folder if that seems like the right thing to do for you. And on our next slide, we have a resources and links page that we have worked to compile for this project to share with you. Um, there are a lot of very helpful links, especially um, the camp support team, camp resource guide. There are also training manuals and how to program your radio. Um, I also included a, a link for the American Red Cross um, visual that you can uh, purchase if you think you want that in your red folder. It shows um, you, uh, how to do CPR um, or first aid. It also shows how to use an AED um, if you have one or there's one available. Um, if you don't have medical personnel in your camp, the chances are um, someone in your camp has 
CPR training or someone nearby may. So it's handy, especially if it's someone who hasn't done it regularly or isn't a medical um, uh, person. Um, all right, so we have made it to our Q&A section. Bex, what kinds of questions and comments do you have for us? Are you able to unmute Bex? Let's see. All right, um, I can see we had a question for Tetris about what is the re recovery position? Um, um, so you have yes. So if you find somebody unconscious and you use Narcan and, and the person wakes up, just lie them on their side. Um, this will help in case they vomit or anything and um, help them get their neuro status back and just keep an eye on them. So that's the recovery position just on their side. You can, you can bend one leg if that helps some sort of balance, but yeah, just get them on their side so they don't vomit and aspirate. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. Bex, are you with us? Oh no, we, your mic is not working. So. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, let's see. While she is working on that, maybe we can go back and um, capture some of our own questions. Okay, there was a question earlier um, for Lucky uh, about um, how do you feel about stronger NSAIDs like the endomethacin, <laughs> I can't say it, <laughs> endomethacin or larger doses of naproxen? Cool. Um, I, you know, and my apologies, I, I messaged that to, um, but I gave that answer to uh, Gabriel directly and I'll, I'll just copy and paste it out to everyone. Um, what I said is I don't, um, there's, um, it, you know, even for gout or something, I would, I would start with ibuprofen in most, um, most cases, if I'm looking for more analgesia, like I said, I would start with ibuprofen and Tylenol, um, together. And then, um, you know, of course I do carry all sorts of other classes of, um, medicines that would be useful for a number of, um, situations, but I, I don't carry into medicine, um, you know, I, it's, it's, it would be more of a, a combination of, 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 of different classes. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, David Crane is wondering if there are any other suggestions regarding medical consent. We had some differing viewpoints about that. Any other thoughts? Um, you know, it's, it's really great to have off playa emergency contacts for everyone in your camp um, for a number of reasons. And, uh, you know, in, in the situation that he describes there where there was someone who was like, you know, puking violently and didn't want to, sounds like they didn't want to go to Rampart and risk getting transported off playa at their own expense. Um, they, you know, they, maybe that person could have talked some sense into them or something. It really sounds like that person just needed to go to uh, uh, Rampart main medical if they were that sick and, um, it, it, you know, you, yeah, you, you want to talk sense into people, but, um, it, you, you can't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we had a situation like that where, um, the person didn't want medical help. And, um, as much as we tried to say, you really need to go, they, they wouldn't go. And then eventually we ended up having to um, alert the system and, and get somebody to come get them. And they were much more compliant once somebody outside of our camp, outside of their friends were able to come, you know, and, and talk them into, 
into going and getting proper help and they ended up in the hospital, so. Any other words of wisdom from our speakers today? I think the one thing we haven't nailed down well enough that comes back to what Tetris was talking about with COVID is, and I'm open to if other people have ideas on this, what, what do we do if the whole camp gets sick? It could be COVID. It could be we know of a camp where um, they had a, another bug go around a few years before. When everybody in your camp gets sick and you're starting to get to the point that you don't know you're going to make it off playa. Um, our current thing is if uh, more than our, you know, a set number gets sick, we're going to all talk about it and try to figure out what's going to happen if we're not going to be able to all make it off, you know, if there aren't going to be enough of us to load out. What's the tipping point? Yeah. 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 So how many people does it take and what that tipping point is? Yeah. That that did happen and is happening. So we need to talk about it. I think we also just need to talk and communicate about um, what our what our strategies are going to be. Um, I know Bridget, your content has um, and suggestions are wonderful, and a lot of burners I know completely disagree. And so we're in camp together, and we need to know what. How, how will we move forward um, disagreeing as we do about what is the safest or best practice? Okay. All right, we have a- One of the things is everybody has to feel safe, right? Everybody uh -huh. has to feel safe, everybody has to have their opinion. So you just do what is safe and you help each other out. That's all you can do, right? Yeah. And I think yeah. one more thing is to uh, contact emergency services if it looks like you're having a epidemiological crisis in your camp so they can help maybe come down with some plans to help you out um, as far as um, you know what this might be and rampart can also help with that kind of stuff travis would a camp be sent home would they have to leave playa not that i know of i'm not representing burning man but i think that the the prudent thing to do is if it looks like your camp is coming down with something, maybe it's time for everybody to take a break off the playa for that year and start to pack up camp before everyone does get sick. Um, Travis might send you home, but Burning Man might no, not. No, I'm not gonna, I don't send anyone home. You have to ride it out yourself. You bought the ticket, you're on the train. So uh, yeah, I, I would just recommend looking at like um, Impulse and Tetris were saying, if people start to get sick, it might be a time to look at a true evaluation and say, hey, we need to start setting, tearing down camp right now before everybody gets ill. Norovirus, rotavirus, influenza outbreaks were, you know, extremely common on the on playa pre-COVID. And um, my understanding is that the norovirus spores survive alcohol, um, you know, hand sanitizer. Um, so that we we do have like a soap and water washing station in our kitchen, and you know, it's a pain because of the gray water and. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if anyone's come up with any solution for that, but um, we've been lucky and not had any uh, norovirus or rotavirus um, outbreaks, but it, it can totally happen. Yeah, good to be thinking about. It's better to be prepared or ready. Um, we have a question for Birdie. So does Zendo or uh, maybe if other speakers know of another resource, um, have information on obscure drugs. Gabriel has had to deal with a camper that needed medical help, um, but didn't recognize one of the substances that the, they had ingested. Um, asking about how, uh, a, like a resource for recognizing drugs on site. I'm not aware of Zendo having a resource like that. I know on Playa, they tend to have a uh, a big poster at each keyhole that um, shows each uh, different class of drugs and the time frame expected for them to um, be experiencing an altered state, things that go along with that altered state, and then interactions between each class. Um, that's super helpful. And I think there might be a reference to it on their website, which is zendoproject.org. Um, but I don't know of a, a resource for identifying by site. Okay. Well, I, I've seen that resource and it is cool. Yeah. 
I think um, MAPS also has one as well. Yeah. All right. Um, any other thoughts from our speakers today? I know, Travis, I don't know if you got to finish what you were wanting to uh, say about fire extinguishers. I think the most important part of that document is to watch that video. It starts off at about 45 seconds and it shows someone actually putting out a real fire. Um, it can be a little bit of a scary experience, but if you see it, it takes the takes the scariness out of it. So just watch that video. I think that's the most important part about that document. Right on. Thanks. All right. Well, um, I want to say thank you to our speakers and um, especially Bex and Abaj, who have been working behind the scenes to keep us rolling and keep this show together. Um, if you have materials that you would like to add to the red folder, please email them to me at epiphany at burningman.org. Our next campfire talk is at 5 p.m. Pacific time on April 25th. It's on BLAST, so the Burner Leadership Achieving Sustainable Theme Camps, and this is by the Green Theme Camp community. Um, so save the date for that. And if you're if interested to volunteer for the camp support team, you can contact us at campsupport at burningman.org. Um, Abaj, if you are able, we are um, able to unmute and say goodbye so um, our participants can wave or, yes. <laughs> oh, good. I see. Yeah, go for Hi, it. Hi, y'all. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, <laughs> bye. Great information. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.